So you want to build one tank that has land-based frogs, Neocaridina shrimp, and guppies all at once. Stay tuned and I'll tell you how I built my 30-gallon paludarium. Hello everybody, welcome to All Things Fish. I'm Mike and thanks for tuning in for another episode. And in this episode, we're gonna do something a little bit different. We're gonna show you how I built my 30 gallon paludarium. Now, uh, they don't always have fish and they don't have to, but in this tank, I actually have six starry night reed frogs, some red cherry shrimp and a group of blue star endlers. So uh, let's take a look at it quick. But before we get into that, I want to thank you so, so much. Uh, we actually hit 200 subscribers last night, uh, and that's a, a pretty big accomplishment, hitting another goal. And as such, like I've said before, we're going to go ahead and give some freebies away to you guys as a thanks for helping me out on this journey. As uh, just a couple weeks ago, I started YouTube. Never imagined that in two weeks I'd have 200 subs already. Uh, but we're cranking out videos, working hard to help you guys out. Hope you guys are enjoying the content. Uh, but let's get to it. Here we go. I've actually been toying around and ended up browsing the internet and got a hankering uh, to set up some kind of tank that originally I thought I wanted um, dart frogs. Um, but dart frogs are a little more terrestrial, not very good swimmers. So I was looking around, talking to uh, a guy at a local shop down in Tucson, Ever Evolving Exotics. Uh, Lee down there is a great guy. If you're ever in the Phoenix or Tucson area, definitely recommend go down, talk to Lee, check out his store. Walking through his store is really what inspired me to make this happen. So I, I, I kind of had some ideas as to what I wanted. I, I found these these reed frogs, the Starry Night reed frogs. It kind of had a really cool pattern. Um, seemed like they were fairly easy to get a hold of. And Lee actually sourced some locally raised uh, frogs for me down in Tucson there. So I found the frogs, knew what I wanted. I already had some fish and shrimp to put in the bottom of this tank. I, I wanted uh, about 10, 11, 12 inches of water in the bottom, and I wanted to, to, to build a shelf that I had in my mind uh, with this arboreal type of background with different plants and some driftwood. Um, so I talked, talked to Lee, got some ideas from, from him, um, and then the, the search began. And the search began, and I found uh, what I thought would be a good tank. It had the good height that I wanted, wasn't super large, but gave me a sufficient amount of room. And this tank ended up being a 30 gallon tall tank. So it wasn't a 29, it was 30 gallon tall, which is 24 wide by 12 deep and 24 high. Uh, so we'll take a look at that. Uh, so, so I got the tank and I actually picked it up cheap on Craigslist used. I think I paid 20 bucks for it from a guy. Um, so I got the tank, was in pretty good shape. Didn't have to do too much to clean it up. I cleaned out the uh, outside and the inside and then decided that I wanted to uh, paint, you know, the, the back black. Wasn't sure exactly what I was going to do for the background yet, um, but a, back, a black background seemed like a good place to start. So I cleaned off the tank, taped it off, messed out, took it out in the garage, and just used a can of Rust-Oleum uh, satin. I think, I think I used a satin finish, uh, black paint. So I sprayed a couple coats on that, and you can look through, uh, through the front to, to see the back and get an idea of where you need to maybe lay a little more paint down. Uh, but I think I put two coats down, let it dry, and then uh, kind of began thinking about things. And uh, here you can see, uh, before I even painted it, I was actually kind of thinking about some ideas in my head, and I wanted a, some sort of water feature, right? So I wanted this shelf, about 10, 12 inches of water, uh, and I wanted some sort of either a waterfall or drip wall. So I decided on a drip wall. So what I did in order to do that was I started thinking about this channel more or less, and it's about six by six inches. I was gonna make this empty spot in the back that was hidden, covered up so you couldn't tell it was there. I was gonna drop a water pump down there um, and then plumb that to some sort of drip wall system. So here you can see, I uh, used some cardboard and just started using cardboard and masking tape to, to mock up how I wanted this, this chamber to be where I was gonna store the pump and use the pump uh, not only as a filter, uh, but to return some water back up to the top of the tank and then use a drip wall. Uh, again, uh, decided how I wanted to build that that column to hide everything, hide the equipment, and then started thinking of ideas for the shelf that I wanted to build. 
Um, so in these, these pictures, you'll kind of see the shelf, and then I knew I need some supports to hold up whatever the shelf was that I was going to make. Um, and you can kind of get an idea of where things started going uh, right here. So I had an idea of what I wanted to do to hide the equipment. I also knew that I wanted fish and shrimp in the bottom, so I needed some sort of filter system uh, set up. So what I did was I more or less built a half wall under this shelf uh, that extended out from that six by six corner box where the pump would be. Uh, and in here, I tried to show you a little depiction of where um, the, the water would flow through. I extended that out and you can kind of see there's a hidden area back there that leads towards the chamber. So after this, I kind of had a pretty good idea in my head of what I wanted to do and started to kind of place some of the hardscape. Worked with, uh, I had a few pieces of driftwood laying around, so I kind of just uh, worked with those to get a rough idea um, if they'd work in the tank, if they'd fit in the, the space I had, if they'd cover up uh, kind of some of the features that I wanted to cover up in the tank and give uh, the inhabitants ultimately uh, a nice place to live. So I knew I'd have to use something that was preferably light but somewhat strong to build these features in this tank. So I ran to Home Depot and just picked, I think it's actually a light diffuser. Some people call it egg crate, um, but I was able to just cut it up with a pair of uh, angle cutters or some snips. It's just, it's thin plastic, but it's pretty sturdy. And I used some zip ties to fasten that together and started working with it, putting it in the tank, um, making sure that it sat in there kind of snug. And I actually just used uh, regular aquarium silicone to uh, play, put that into place. And now that the, the back of the tank is painted, the egg crate is kind of starting to form into place. You can see that pretty well. You can see the, the shelf that I was talking about, the supports underneath. You can see the, the pump chamber area in the back section there. And things are kind of starting to look like they might come together here soon. Again, here you can see that where the, the water will flow through back to the pump chamber area behind that uh, the, the small wall that I made to hide that area where the uh, filtration will go. And here's the piece that I cut out for the filter. Um, I wanted to keep inhabitants from going back there. So what I used is just some black plastic craft mesh, cut it to fit, and then I used a monofilament fishing line and just basically stitched it to the egg crate to hold it in place. And as far as filter media goes, uh, in front of this piece of mesh that you can see there, I actually just used a piece of coarse filter sponge. I believe it came out of one of my AquaClear filters, but it fit there perfectly. Uh, basically creates uh, you know, a, a powered filter right away. The water sucks through the main chamber at the bottom of the tank into that pump chamber, and then ultimately it'll end up going through a, a piece of vinyl tubing up to the top where I created a drip wall that we'll see later. And here we go into kind of test fitting, making sure this will hold up to some of the weight that will be on it with the driftwood. Trying driftwood in different positions, seeing how it will cover up uh, some of the different uh, features in the tank. Additionally, other than the driftwood, I used some cork that I got from Lee at Ever Evolving Exotic. He was super helpful. I uh, got this cork and started kind of placing that in the back of the tank to cover up that back wall so it didn't just look like a plain black piece of glass in the back and I wanted something on it. And that cork offered me a great place to be able to plant, uh, place my plants and hold those into place until they really rooted. So after getting the egg crate laid down, I had to uh, develop uh, the background itself and kind of the structure of the shelf and, and some of the features in the tank. So I ended up using great stuff that was available at Home Depot. I used the black for any features that I thought you'd be able to see, particularly in the bottom. Uh, and then I used the regular yellow. I think it was a little cheaper uh, just to use in filler areas and some of the stuff that would be up out of the water. So here you can see how I sprayed that onto the egg crate. And I would recommend wearing rubber gloves with this and keeping a clean workspace. Uh, it is pretty tough to, to try to pick off like your skin and stuff. So definitely cover up your skin. I didn't notice any irritation, but it was tough to clean up. And before that foam dried, what I did was I placed some lava rock in place uh, to build up that area so I didn't have to use so much of that foam and then while that foam was still a little moist I actually filtered out. I had some Eco Complete on hand so I got some some of the fine Eco Complete, patted that down on the foam as it dried to create a little bit more of a realistic texture and then I started putting the wood into place uh, once the lower section of the tank was done started placing the, putting the wood in place and again that foam sticks pretty well 
and it held the wood and then ultimately the cork into place along the back just fine while creating some 3D structure and some pockets to use for plants. Up out of the water section and above that shelf, I did use this cocoa fiber uh, and you simply just add a little bit of water and it fluffs up real quick. And I used that to, to cover that up to give it a, both a natural texture and something to hold a little moisture, provide some moisture for the plants and some keep some humidity in the tank. Here you can see kind of the finished product of how things looked uh, before kind of getting some plants in there and water testing it. You can see how it really creates a, a 3D background and real realistic look, something to to give you some something to look at and not just a plain black background. And it'll actually fill in quite nicely. You'll see shortly in the video how I was able to put some plants in there. And of course, uh, after I let that sit and dry, I was able to stand the tank up, kind of admire my work, take a few different pictures to show off and let you guys see uh, how the build is progressing. And then the scissors was fairly tall tank, so the way I lit this uh, was using a 4 by 24 watt T5 high output fixture. Um, I used, uh, I think, a, a couple 6500K uh, tubes that I had laying around, and then I actually used a, an actinic and a purple plus to use as a nightlight. And then once everything was squared away, I poured the rest of my Eco Complete that I wanted to use for the substrate in the bottom. And you can kind of see how that looks here. I used a fairly thick layer. I wanted some plants down there, and we'll see later in the video that I used some aquatic plants uh, that actually ended up growing up immersed out of the water. Uh, but so far, I was pretty happy with the, the way it was turning out. Uh, I was really excited to get some plants in there, but I wanted to make sure that uh, every, though it kept water where it wanted to be, water out of where it didn't need to be. And then I used, like I said, the clear PVC tubing and a pump similar to like a Maxi Jet 900, just a small powerhead pump, probably 15, 20 bucks. And I ran a piece of clear PVC tubing up across the back of the tank. And I just used a drill to drill some holes into that tubing. So when the water, the, the water gets pumped out of the, it, it flows out of the main tank section there through that sponge filter into the pump section. The pump sends it up that clear acrylic tubing across the back of the tank and ultimately creating both a drip wall on the back for moisture for plants as well as a small uh, water feature to aerate the main water body of the tank. So once I had it wet, everything was running the way I wanted it. I took this sphagnum moss and there's different species. Of, uh, it's different uh, varieties. I think mine came in a bag and I used that and I acquired some plants again from Lee at Ever Evolving Exotics like some bromeliads and some vining plants. And I took that sphagnum moss and I used that to uh, stuff the plants into some crevices, especially in that cork. The cork will hold it really well. And that sphagnum moss keeps it tight until it roots down. So here you can see kind of some of those plants that I used. And a lot of these plants actually came out of one of my aquariums, such as the Hydrocotyl leucocephala and Hydrocotyl tripartita japan. So we're actually starting to get somewhere. Things are starting to look like, you know, something pretty aesthetic that could maybe sustain some life here and things are looking good. That four by T4, four by T5 HO fixture uh, really grew the plants well. And as the tank matured, it actually, uh, the plants grew crazy and it, it became a little bit of a chore to keep them trimmed. So I actually removed uh, one of the daylight bulbs and one of the actinic bulbs to bring the lighting down and kind of slow the plant growth down a little bit. So now that we had a tank that was fairly finished, planted, and ready to sustain life, I went down to Ever Evolving Exotics again, picked up my Starry Night Reed Frogs that Lee had sourced for me uh, from a local breeder, and I did get six of those. I believe they were three males and three females, although they were fairly young. A couple of them weren't sexable right away, but he gave me some super healthy specimens. So I picked up some of those frogs from him, and I picked up some uh, fruit wingless fruit fly cultures and we uh, headed home to get these guys in the tank into their new home that had been you know running the plants that had been growing everything looked good the water was clean i used filter media from my previous tank uh, so that was that was keeping beneficial bacteria in this tank and i actually introduced them in the evening with just the evening light that actinic type of bulb so you can see uh one of the little guys here getting ready to go in the tank 
and here they are they're starting to browse around check out their surroundings and it's actually uh, quite neat they're mostly nocturnal uh, from from my experience keeping these guys mostly nocturnal uh, however you can uh, find them wandering out and about during the day sometimes often like you can see here on these bromeliad leaves And you'll notice in the following pictures uh, throughout the, the video here that uh, the pattern on them can vary based on their mood, the time of day, etc. These guys are actually fairly easy to keep. One of the reasons that I chose these guys for this polydarium setup with such a deep water feature in the bottom is because they are actually pretty decent swimmers um, and they are easy to feed. You can feed them depending on their size, either pinhead crickets. Uh, most of the time I fed them flightless fruit flies, which were pretty easy to culture. I used media from Josh's frogs uh, and then find a, a, a local herpetologist type guy that's got some fruit flies handy and they, they're pretty self-sustaining for the most part. Like I said earlier, the, the lights uh, were probably a little bit overkill so things grew in pretty quick and you can see some of the growth here uh, with some really lush plant growth. I had uh, some, some Nile River violets I think in there uh, and, and a variety of other plants. So we had the tank set up, filled up, plants were growing, we added the frogs, and then also added some red cherry shrimp from my colony, which reside in the bottom with some various uh, plants down there. There's a little bit of java moss, some bocephalandra, and some anubias, as well as, which would later be added, some persicaria, which persicaria, if you haven't kept it, uh, needs a little bit more light, but it has no problem growing up out of the water in an immersed state and will actually flower pretty easily. And you know things are happy and things are going well when your shrimp colored up, your endlers are spawning, and then you hear these sounds one night. And those are the vocalizations of the males. The females, uh, to my knowledge, uh, do not actually make any vocalizations at all, but the males are quite loud. Uh, I think it's a pretty neat sound. However, I don't know if I'd want the tank to be next to my bed at night because they can be pretty noisy and are nocturnal. Uh, so here's a few more images of some of the frogs throughout the tank. So we'll just take a minute to enjoy those. And as far as maintenance goes on this tank and in paludariums in general, um, you are working with a high humidity tank, so you will have to uh, do, do some additional cleaning. Uh, while some certain slime molds are okay, you really want to watch out for funguses, keep things a little bit clean when you are able. Um, plants, it, I trim the plants pretty regularly. You trim them just like you would any, any other plant, just trim them. Uh, and you can mount extras somewhere else or you can share them with a friend. The aquatic plants did uh, grow quite well, even down low, away from the light, uh, but I just trimmed those normally, even the, the immersed ones, you trim those off. And you can transition those back to submerged uh, fairly easily just by placing them in your tank. Like I said, the frogs earlier, I fed pinhead crickets and flightless fruit flies, both of which were fairly easy to get a hold of and easy to keep and feed and dust those as appropriate with your favorite mineral supplements. So there she is guys, my 30 gallon polyodarium which houses starry night reed frogs, red cherry neocaridina shrimp, and blue star endlers. Unfortunately I don't have any images or video of the blue star endlers in the bottom. However, the cherry shrimp colony uh, was constantly breeding, constantly expanding uh, just as well as the, the blue star endlers. The blue star endlers are a small enough strain that they usually don't predate on the shrimp too much. Frogs got along just fine. 
every now and then you'd see one end up in the water, whether it slid off the glass or, or whatnot, uh, but they had no problem climbing up, jumping up, uh, getting up onto the shore, the, the land areas out of the tank, so I didn't lose any frogs. You have to be careful with your frog, frog species selection, as not all frogs are very good swimmers, such as some of the dart frogs, I believe, that are more land-based. Uh, you can actually drown them in very small amounts of water. So again, just to recap, 30 gallon tank, use some silicone to place some egg crate in there, which is easily cuttable with uh, scissors or some pliers, like some side cutter snips. Get that into place, attach it together with zip ties, coat that in your great stuff foam, which can be easily found at Home Depot, Lowe's, if you have a Menards, if you're in the kind of the Midwest, Menards is a great option too, but that's easily sourceable, or you can order it on Amazon. Uh, obviously a lot of your supplies you can order on Amazon. Let that sit for a couple days and cure. I used the cocoa fiber again to coat things. I also used the cork and driftwood to add 3D structure and mounting points for plants. Then source out some plants, whether it's a local shop, you may be able to do a greenhouse, a herb shop or a fish store may have some of the bromeliads or something. Find your shrimp, find your fish, find your frogs, uh, and make sure you could take good care of them, feed them, feed them what's required and what's best for that frog. And I personally haven't had any breeding success in this tank yet. However, I know a lot of people that regularly collect and hatch out eggs, uh, which it hatch out into tadpoles and then end up growing up into frogs. And they are able to share those and get new people set up uh, with some new species and some new things to try. So that's it for today. If you have any questions about this setup, uh, or if you're, you're thinking about setting something up and, and you want to know my experiences, a little more detailed information, feel free to leave a comment below or email me mike.allthingsfish at gmail.com. I'll gladly help you out. But that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned something. Maybe it inspired you to set up something a little bit different than your ordinary fish tank or your ordinary uh, terrarium type setup. And we'll see you next time. Make sure you like, share, subscribe, hit the bell. Do me a favor, hit the bell. That way you know when I release that 200 subscribers giveaway video. And that will probably come out sometime in the next couple days. So you don't want to miss it. Thanks again. Have a great day.